Hi, my name is Shiva Akhtar and today I'm going to talk about um, the Indus Valley Civilization and in particular uh, one of the sculptural pieces that has been excavated from this civilization. So uh, we are talking about the Indus Valley Civilization which is contemporary with the other great civilizations, um, the most ancient civilizations of the world uh, and in particular uh, we speak about its relationship to uh, the, the ancient civilization of Egypt in Africa and to the Mesopotamian civilization of the Middle East which are contemporary with it and like it and like the other um, civilization in China all of these are riverine civilizations which means that they all uh, developed along rivers and that is uh, quite e uh, self-evident because for civilizations to practice agriculture a reliable source of water was important which the rivers provided. Now um, in one way the Indus Valley civilization is very different from the other uh, ancient civilizations in particular Egypt and Mesopotamia which is the geographical extent of this civilization. Unlike the, the relatively limited extent of the other two, this is a very extensive civilization which uh, extends all the way from northwest India across Pakistan and Afghanistan and Iran all the way to the Persian Gulf to the area of Bahrain in the Middle East. So in terms of area, it is a much larger geographical extent. Uh, the heart of the civilization, in other words, out of the 1,200 or so sites that have been excavated and identified, um, the most important concentration occurs primarily in Pakistan along the Indus River. And the most important sites are also in this area, with the exception of Lothal, which is in India. Uh, the first city to be excavated was Harappa. Uh, and so it's also called the Harappan civilization. But in terms of the quantity and the quality of the artifacts, the, the most important city and site is Mohenjo-daro in southern Pakistan. This shows the concentration of the, of the Indus Valley sites. And as you can see, the most important concentration is in southern Pakistan and northwest India, with Mohenjo-daro being here and Harappa in north, northern northeast Pakistan. Now here we're looking at what is called the Acropolis or the highest point of the city of Mohenjo-daro. Um, it's a very large uh, city, only 10% of it has so far been excavated. Um, and I'm just showing you some quick aerial views to give you an idea of... Uh, now this structure uh, is a later stupa from the Buddhist period so we should not consider this as one of the structures of the Indus Valley sites. It belongs to about 500 BCE, so much, much later. Um, just quick views of uh, the Acropolis of Mohenjo-daro. Uh, most of the art that comes from this civilization uh, is miniature, and much of it consists of seals, stamp seals, uh, which are carved with bulls which are masculine, they're not the cow, not a single cow has been found, they're all bulls and they are typical in the, the humped bull is the typical for this civilization. Very unfortunately, the script has not yet been deciphered, uh, so we don't have uh, any way of knowing in detail too much about the beliefs, uh, beliefs of the people or their values or any written records uh, have not been deciphered yet. Um, all the, sculpt, uh, the figures are miniature, they are really quite small, a few inches at most, um, and they, m the majority consists of uh, female figurines which probably represent fertility goddesses, which represent the fertility of the human race, um, or they represent little animals probably as toys for children. The, the exception, and this is significant, consists of these, uh, consists of 16 um, sculptures that have been discovered at Mohenjo-daro, which are almost seven of which are identical. So the 16 which are larger than the miniature 
uh, none of them are life size and none of them certainly are monumental in the way that Egyptian sculptures are. Um, they are all about um, a foot and a half to two feet large and out of the 16, seven are almost identical male statues, statuettes. Um, this is one that has been discovered which is missing its head um, and um, because they are all identical um, scholars feel that this particular posture was probably significant and what is shown is a male wearing a kind of a toga or robe seated with one knee lifted holding uh, the, the hand cupping that knee and probably this was uh, a prayer posture because it was a significant posture for all seven to be shown in this posture. Uh, so this one is missing its head while this one which I'm going to talk about at some length today um, is missing most of its body but has uh, fortunately the head is very well preserved uh, and the reason that they can conjecture that these were identical is the common parts which have survived in this one and in the previous one which are the torso are identical so um, scholars feel that probably this one was also similarly seated and therefore this ritualized posture was probably a, a posture of prayer now uh, i will be talking about this one which has been labeled the priest king so this is probably the most famous sculpture to come from the Indus Valley Civilization, the Priest King. Now the reason that he has been named the Priest King uh, is, um, let me first show you some other views of him. Here are some close-up shots. Uh, let us uh, talk a little bit about what seems uh, important. He is, uh, his eyes are closed. And it's a very serene expression, so probably an expression of prayer, contemplation, meditation. Um, he is, the second point is that he is wearing a cloak which is different from the other six figures which are considered to be identical. He is the only one whose cloak is ornamented with this motif which has been called the trefoil motif meaning three leafed one two three like a clover so the trefoil motif seems to be a significant aspect of his cloak in other words this ornament probably symbolized uh, his rank so that it is probably a prestige symbol now what is this trefoil and what does it symbolize? So here are some more uh, views at the back and you can see how much it is repeated throughout the, the robe and um, therefore we, we must ask ourselves what it means. Well, scholars have conjectured that in the ancient world this was an astral motif, meaning that it was equivalent to being an astral motif. In other words, astral meaning star, so that it symbolized or represented a star. Now, you might turn around and say to me, I've never seen a star that looks like that. Have, has anyone ever seen a star that looked like that? No. But then I'm going to turn around and ask you, have you ever seen a star that looked like this exactly? No. Sim basically, motifs are simplifications of real things so that if as a society we all agree today that a five-pointed figure is a star even though no star actually looks like that then if we are all in agreement that this represents a star then the ancient people very logically could all agree that a trefoil was a star and in that at that time whenever somebody saw that they would say, oh, it's a star. And if the United States had existed in that period, then you would have 50 little trefoils in a corner, all representing the 50 states of the United States. But that is not what happened then. In any case, 
So talking about the prestigious uh, trefoil motif, um, what we do know is that the trefoil motif was not just a motif used in the Indus Valley. It was also a motif that was used in Mesopotamia. So here I'm showing you uh, part of the, the rear of a bull in Mesopotamia. By the way, in Mesopotamia too, the bull was revered, not the cow. It's in Egypt that the Hathor cow is revered. Um, but uh, the, the bull in Mesopotamia was, was considered divine because of two reasons. The bull was used in agriculture. It enabled the soil to be productive as in the Indus Valley and therefore uh, the bull was associated, the power of the bull was associated with the power of fertility of the soil which, which enabled civilization, human life in fact to exist. So the divinity of the bull was associated with the trefoil motif and in Egypt we have the Hathor cow who is also a divine creature and she too is decorated here with the trefoil motif. So in all three civilizations we see the recurrence of this trefoil motif and it is always associated with divinity. Now another reminder of the bovine family whether they are cows or bulls being associated with fertility and therefore with divinity is that at harvest time the ancient people noticed that the constellations of the stars, if you join the stars together, made up a bull, which is called the Taurus in the zodiac. And that occurs at, at springtime, the zodiac uh, Taurus symbol, and that is the time of harvest. So the fertility of the soil, the picture of the bull in the sky or the cow in the sky, reinforced that idea that this animal is divine and therefore a, a, a motif which is used to decorate that animal which consists of the star motif in the sky is associated with divinity. So when we come back to a figure such as the priest king or a human figure whose cloak has the trefoil motif we can assume that he has divine status in his society. And for that reason, and together with his meditative expression, uh, he is probably a priest. And the king, why? Because in most civil, ancient civilizations, the, the king was also the high priest. Or um, the, the, two, um, uh, were, the two roles were sort of um, one and the same. So given the fact that his headband is missing probably a jewel or a precious stone together with the the prestige of the symbol um, in the absence of any written records that could be deciphered so far because the writing has not been deciphered um, the this particular sculpture which is the most um, significant one to come from the Indus Valley civilization has been called the priest king thank you